<laughs> this is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Aquarium Mania. I'm your host, Dr. Roy Anong, speaking to you from the University of Florida IFAS Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Thanks for joining us. South American river systems, the native range for many aquarium fish species, are beautiful, biodiverse, and rich in complexity. My guest today, Ivan Mikolji, is a world-renowned naturalist, explorer, researcher, audiovisual artist, and author. Ivan has been sharing his river adventures through breathtaking films and photographs of South American species for the past 15 years. Join us as Ivan explains how an early love of science and nature in his native Venezuela drove him to documentation of spectacular species and biotopes, education, and conservation efforts. We'll be right back after these messages. So now I've got this pack of four Sharpe rescue dogs for, oh my goodness, probably five, six years. They get a regular diet of Dynavite with every meal. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot People remark on what beautiful coats they've got. I tell them, you don't need to wait until a problem presents itself. It's far better to keep the dog happy and healthy at all times. You won't believe how happy your dog will be. I get my Dynavite from D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. My guest today is Ivan Mikolji. Ivan, thanks again for your time. Thanks for having me here. So I, I always like to ask some uh, kind of personal history questions just to get everybody a little bit more grounded in where you're coming from. So uh, before we go into all your adventures and some of the uh, interesting things that you've done over the, the many years, how did you first get interested in science, nature, and uh, and even the aquarium hobby? Oh, well, there was always, from since I was a kid, there was always an aquarium at home. I remember that we moved between two cities a lot, depending on where we. my parents had more work. And the first thing I packed was always the aquarium. So I've been an aquarium person since I was a kid. And also at school, when I could never sit in my desk, you know, I always wanted to be outside. I was always looking out the window. I wanted to be out climbing a tree. And uh, there was a big mountain behind the, the school, a pristine mountain down here in Venezuela. And every time that there was recess or after school activities, people would run to play soccer or four square basketball. And I would run into the mountain. And this was a problem because there was pit vipers and rattlesnakes, you know, and we would grab them and bring them and all the teachers would freak out. So I was out in nature all the time. So you don't happen to remember your very first aquarium setup, do you? Or, or did you have just so many that it was hard to uh, pinpoint? No, I, I remember my aquariums back when I was a kid. It was, it was a very diverse neighborhood aquarium. We had, for example, mollies from Mexico mixed with uh, betas from Siam and zebrafish from India, and then rams from cichlids from Venezuela. So it was, it was very cosmopolitan. But nowadays, I'm the judge in many biotope contests, aquarium contests worldwide. And now things are getting more specific, more interesting. So if you keep, for example, the same molly from Mexico, you keep the pH with what is in that same river and the plants that are in the same river. So it's gotten more interesting now, the aquarium hub. Now, you mentioned when you gave me some of your history that you, you actually had some non-aquatic jobs early on. Can you tell us a little bit about working as an English teacher and with your parents' business and, and maybe anything you learned from that that you're using today? Yeah, so early on, I was working for my parents in their business, and it was, it was really nice. It was interesting because we had a rubber lining and sandblasting company. So we used to go, it was for the basic industries of the state. So we would go all over Venezuela, rubber lining these humongous tankers and oil rigs, etc. And we would spend months doing this. For example, I'd be, we'd go down near the Orinoco River, down in the Lost World, to an oil rig, and we'd be there for two months inside of a tank. And uh, I remember we used to have, when these companies stop, they lose millions. So you have to stop working nonstop. 
and we had uh, one Sunday every two weeks off. And that Sunday, I would always drive around looking for clear waters, looking for streams. So by the end, after so many years, I knew a lot of places to go to. And that helped me a lot when I became a full-time river explorer. Yeah, that sound, definitely sounds like tough work. Anything, uh, any interesting quick stories as an English teacher or, or is that... Um... Wow, that was a brief period and nothing much interesting there. Uh-huh. I was teaching ESL kids who needed, you know, but it was, it was not as interesting as the other ones, you know, as the oil rigs. Yeah, that definitely sounds quite a bit different from what you're doing. So then you actually owned a tropical fish export business. Can you uh, maybe give us a brief on all of that? Sure. I lived here in Valencia, as well, and I said, of course, I always wanted to breed discus fish. And there was a very good discus breeder back in the day called Hans Kepke. He was a German-born ichthyologist, and he had his house full of discus fish. So I used to go to his house, and he used to tell me how he showed me how to breed these fish. So luckily, he, unlucky for him, but his wife told him he wanted, she wanted to move to Spain. So he said, listen, you want to keep all my discus. So I brought all the discus home and put them in my garage. And there was, I don't know, 30 pairs of discus. And they started breeding and uh, we were having hundreds of fries. So I used to buy tanks and bigger tanks to put all the fry in and for water changes. So uh, by, I don't know, in three months, my wife was already said, listen, you have to get this out. It's taking over the house. So I brought all this stuff to the company where we did all the sandblasting. And in six months, this breeding <laughs> took over the whole company. It got so big. We were breeding thousands of discus. We had an angel fish. We had so many fish that we saturated the national market and we had to start exporting them. Uh, that's funny. So what, what made you decide you didn't want to do it anymore? After, after a while, I saw that my passion was really to go exploring. And when you have these amount of fish... You really can't go much anywhere. Even if you leave someone in charge, it's too much. So it was getting in the way of exploring and you have to make choices in your life. And I decided to shut that down and become a full-time explorer. And that's how it got shut down. That makes sense. Yeah, but farming is definitely a 24-7 job. So so, um, before we start diving a little bit more deep, can you maybe give us and share your overall philosophy on why you do what you do and what you're hoping you can kind of accomplish through it? For uh, you know, for our listeners. Well, when I started exploring and I started bringing, that was in late 2005, and I was starting to bring all these images of the fish I was taking in the wild, and I bring them back and I'd show them to Facebook was starting and YouTube was starting, and I used to put them in all these. I used to look for them in atlases, the fish atlases, and most of them weren't there, and if they were there, they didn't look the same. So I started posting this in fish blogs and everything, the pictures. And most of the people didn't even know what they were. So many people told me, listen, go to the university in Venezuela, in Caracas, and they have a good ichthyologist there. And I went there, and they told me, listen, these are new species. Where are you finding these? So it dawned on me that my work had something special because people didn't know what we had. When I used to go to the creek and I used to show the pictures to the people that were there, that lived next to the river, they didn't know these, these fish were in there. They knew the fishes that they could eat, or they had to fish, or they, but the smaller fish, or other fish they didn't eat, they didn't know they existed. So from then on, I had the vision that we had to show people what they have so they can preserve. You cannot preserve something that you don't know exists. And that's what I've been trying to do for the past 15 years. So I, I know you, and I really uh, admired your, your work and appreciate you showing me and getting me to your links and, and definitely beautiful, beautiful things in your, and uh, I love the way you write as well. What were some of your earliest challenges when you were first getting into photography and video and things that you learned from that? Oh my. Well, the first things that I learned is that when you start doing something, you have to buy the best gear. I'm really, I started with gear that was not, the best one, I used to buy point and shoot cameras because I didn't know if I was going to be well doing this, you know, for a long time or not. And for the first five years, I never bought a professional camera. So it was when I try to publish those images now, it's pretty hard. And it's I was spending 10 days out of the month in the bush or more. So it's it's if you add it up, it's 
50 or, or 40 expeditions that are lost just in images. So you have to have the best gear you can get. Don't cheap out on gear. You have to have the best gear you can get. I had a chance to read your pretty recent article on the green neon tetras in the wild that you did for Practical Fishkeeping magazine and uh, really enjoyed how you wrote and, and all the photographs, of course. And um, your uh, editor, Nathan Hill, mentioned kind of your uh, gonzo journalist approach, which I actually had to look up because I wasn't sure what that meant. But I, I definitely <laughs> agree. I definitely agree with him. When you're sort of planning one of these stories, how do you sort of think about setting it up? Or what do you what are the things you, you try to include when you're um, setting up for both the, the writing as well as the photos? Well, you know, writing is an art, but Really, I don't think of myself as a particularly special person or writer. The stories are special because the places are special. I really just write what I'm looking at, what I'm feeling, what I'm smelling, or whatever I see. The story just going there. And if it's a magnificent story, it's just because the places are magical. If you go down to the, some of these places in the Amazon, they're so incredible that just explaining what you see becomes a, something very... People can view things through what you can write, right? So that's what I do. I just write what I see and what we do. They become these stories, these adventures, you know? But if they're all legit. They're all real. It's exactly what I feel or what I see. Yeah, definitely can feel and see when you uh, put the, your um, words down with the photographs. You've done a lot of, obviously, social media sharing of images and stories, and I had a chance to look at some of your episodes with George Fear and when you guys were the fish guys. Any kind of comments on the fish guys? I know it, it, you sort of have, I think, kind of left that venue, but kind of working with other folks and working with George, what were some of your thoughts in developing that Explorer series? Yeah, well, the fish guys, it's pretty interesting because I have many videos that are not controversial, but they're people think about or they raise many questions. And the fish guys... You have to understand what we were doing. And we probably did something wrong by naming it the fish guys. Although we were fish guys, we were really always in search of clear water. That's what we were doing. And that's probably what we were, we had to name it. But we really wanted to show people what it was really like to go on these expeditions. If we just showed them the underwater footage, it really wasn't like being there. So we, we would spend hours on end because down in the Amazon here, there's, there's no airports. And if there is an airport, there's nowhere to rent a car. So you have to bring your car down there, and it takes hours. We, we, for example, the last the expedition two, the first day we drove 15 hours. The next day it was 12 hours. And then after that, every day we would drive, drive at least six hours a day. So we would spend more time in the car driving and talking than actually in the bush doing our videos. So we thought it was relevant to document what we were talking about. And that's why it's edited in such a, like a linear way. It's not edited to entertain. It wasn't meant to entertain. It was just meant to, for you to feel that you were there. You know? But that's the fish guys, that was the objective. It was just to show people how it looked. And yeah, so yeah, and that actually makes a lot, a lot of sense. People don't understand all the hard work that goes into getting two minutes of footage, you know? So, exactly. Yeah, that's, so that, that was the idea behind it. Yeah, that's great. So before we get into some of the stories now, let's take a short break and we'll continue our discussion with my guest, Ivan Mikulji, after these messages. It's October! And there are spooky scares everywhere. When it comes to your dog's everyday health, you don't have to be spooked when you have Daily Dose. Daily Dose is a two-in-one dog chew that pairs a powerful dental scrub with vet-developed supplements for full body health and seriously clean smiles. Now pay attention through October 31st Enter for a chance to win all four bags of Daily Dose in coming joint, heart, and skin health. Just post a picture of your pup smile with the hashtag Serious Smile Sweeps to any of Pet Life Radio's Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook pages. Good luck! <laughs> Visit YourPetsDailyDose.com to save $3 on your first bag with promo code PETLIFE. That's YourPetsDailyDose.com. 
Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> We're back and continuing our conversation with my guest, Ivan Mikolji, naturalist, explorer, educator, and photo and filmmaker. So, Ivan, let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, beauty, biotope, and and species that you are sharing with everybody. Can you share uh, two or three real memorable adventures? Oh, wow. Okay. One of the most memorable adventures was climbing the Tabiripa Falls. Now, the Tamaripa Falls are down in the center of the, let's say, the, the Guyana Shield, western center in the west of the Guyana Shield. And it's a waterfall that is not completely vertical. It has a slant to it. But it's a place that nobody had ever explored that we know of. There's no register anywhere of people going up that waterfall and seeing what's on the top. So we decided to go, and the first attempt, we couldn't make it to the top. We could barely make it to the bottom of the fall. And in the second attempt, when we went with George Fear, we got to the top, but we thought we were going to die the whole <laughs> way. We saw it on the road and we said, okay, let's go. But we weren't, we weren't prepared. So we were going up the fall, climbing with a cast net. We throw the cast net to a person in the bottom, pull the person up. And once we were up there, we were like, how are we getting down? And it was a very hard situation for the moment. It was one one of those things where we got in the bottom, uh, they got, uh, George Fear got lost. It was very problematic. Oh, thank God everything came out well, but it was, it was one of those adventures that changed everybody's life and, you know, <laughs> changes the way you, you view things. And everybody felt very happy to be alive at the end. Were there any interesting fish or uh, did you guys see anything different that you hadn't seen yet before? Yeah, well, the cool thing about these natural barriers is that the fish that get to the bottom, most fish can't climb. And the fish that are on the top die if they fall. So (laughs) after thousands of years, the species that are on the top start to change. And the fish that we found up there are totally different than the fish that are in the bottom. And we got the voucher specimens for the museum, and they're in the museum waiting to be described. So it was really nice. And we always register a lot of new plants. It's not my inventory of plant or flower videos and pictures is much larger than the fish one. I'm known for fish videos, and, but the registration of new species of orchids and new species of plants, or even aquatic plants, is more than the fish one. But I'm known for the fish. We find new, really new cool species of orchids and everything in these places. So how, is, how bad are uh, bugs and mosquitoes and that sort of thing? Are they pretty, pretty brutal? Oh, this comes out in my book. Everything down here, it's brutal with the mosquitoes, except one place. And that's Caño Cristales in Colombia, where you could go there and there's no no seams, no gnats, no horse flies. There's no mosquitoes. You don't need repellent. And that's just wonderful when you're there and you could work without, you know, being swatting and everything. Because they get in front of the lens and everything. Over there, you don't have to worry about it. But it's, they're everywhere, yes. You have to be very careful and always use repellent because of the diseases, you know, yellow fever and everything else. Any other, uh, any second stories you'd like to share? We, oh, there's so many. We've ran across up in the Chaviripa Falls the first time we went. We got chased out of the river by electric eels. Uh-huh. Now, when you're there in the middle of the water and you're floating, you can't see how deep it is. It's so deep. You barely see your feet because the water is dark at the bottom. And you have all these eels coming after you. You really have to swim as hard as you can. And when you're crossing all these rivers, you can't step over the sand. You have to drag your feet because of the rays. There's many stingrays in the river. So you have to drag your feet all the time when you're crossing these rivers. It's an adventure being there. So what about Orinoco crocodiles or caiman? Did you ever have to worry about those? You always worry about them, but they're very scarce. And they're more, you find them more in water that is silty, that is white water. And we usually don't get in the white water because we can't video underwater. But I once was swimming in this flooded area. There's a flooded area in the Venezuelan Llanos that has clear water. It's crystal clear. And you're swimming in there, and you're in the middle of a field, acres and acres until the horizon of flooded water. And I ran into a big croc, big cane, and I was videoing it 
and I have footage of it. I'm videoing it. It's floating on top, like floating under the water with its nose out. And my camera, the tape in it, it was back in the day, there was tape and it ran out. I ran out of tape. So now my problem was going backwards. How was I going to leave and give my back to this croc? So it was really, I had to back up looking at it all the time. And you don't know what is behind you because you're always looking. It's a very bizarre situation. And once it's out of your sight, you really don't know where it is or if there's more. So <laughs> once you lose sight of something, it's even worse if you don't know where it is. Yeah, that would probably uh, make me a little bit apprehensive, but definitely w- you know, would be worth it to see some of those places. Now, I've watched uh, some of your wild aquarium videos, which are really, really uh, amazing. Can you explain what your concept of the uh, wild aquarium is and kind of what your intent is for these sort of temporary hands-on type exhibits? Uh, the wild aquarium was a concept to bring the aquarium hobby outside, to let people know that there's something beyond the aquarium. You see, aquarium, the aquarium hobby is usually a personal thing, that you and I person, you and I person, personal hobby. One person in his house, and he's, that's it. We wanted to show people that they could go out and explore and bring their kids and see nature and bring the aquarium hobby outside as an educational tool as well. So, for example, we went to Mexico last year, and there was a fish that was going extinct. And we brought the aquarium next to the river in Mexico where it was going extinct. And the, the city got all these kids from the school and they went to the river, which was being polluted a little. And they went and they grabbed the rocks, they grabbed the water, we put it in the aquarium. And all of a sudden, and we put the fish and we explained what everything did and all the insects and everything. And all of a sudden that creek that the kids just saw as a creek became their special, their special creek which had a very special fishing that was going extinct. So we're using the aquarium for the first time as an eco-educational tool, not just in your house there. That was the idea behind it. And that's what we're doing. That's great. Definitely a great idea and and a really good educational tool. So you're, again, not only a naturalist and incredible visual storyteller, you also act as a kind of an ecosystem ambassador, educator, scientist. Can we talk a little bit about some of these areas? You mentioned, I think to me, and I saw on your site, World Fish Migration Day. What is that about and what, what are you doing in, in your involvement? Well, World Fish Migration is a great way to get people involved to learn about fish. So they have um, an event a day in the year where all these people around the world go near a body of water or talk about the fish that are in, their, in the nearest body of water to their house. And this brings kids outside, educators from all over the world. And my wife is from Plymouth, Massachusetts. And this year was gonna be hosted, it was the prime location of the World uh, Migration Day was gonna be in Plymouth. So I wanted to give a speech there, I wanted to talk and, and get involved with them. And I did, because they have, in Plymouth they have, for example, the heron that go migrate into the salt water, and they come back into fresh water to breed, and lay their eggs. And I've photographed them so much in the wild up there. So I wanted to be involved and tell the story about them. So that's my involvement with them. You know, gotcha. With the world migration. Okay. It's and, a way to hook up with people that have the same interest. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, now you also are working with the, the IUCN, um, the Freshwater Biodiversity Unit to assess fishes in the Orinoco River. I think, you know, we will definitely, you know, mention your book, your upcoming book and and, uh, all the fishes of the Orinoco River in our second part interview, which we'll do a little bit, hopefully next month. But can you maybe give a little bit of a intro to the Orinoco right now and what you will be doing with IUCN? The IUCN does an excellent job assessing the threats that the fish have in the wild or any animal. I'm assessing the fish, for example, from part of the Orinoco with a lot of scientists. It's not only me. There's a whole team. But I give them some information that we get in our trips. If we In in our trips, we see that there's mining, for example, illegal mining. So we say, listen, this fish is uh, threatened because of this. But the problem, too, is that we have around 1,150 species described for the Orinoco River Basin. But in the museums, we have 200 new species that haven't been described. And there's many more in the, in the water that have not even been described. And those can't even be assessed until they're described. 
So we have so much work to do. The IUCN is going to have work. They have to wait for us, for us to find funding to describe these species, for them then to enter them, because they're, they're undescribed. We find new species of sponges, of mussels, of clams in every expedition, freshwater sponges, so there's, and crabs. And so it's, it's overwhelming the amount of things that are still unknown to people. We still don't know what we have. We haven't finished the inventory. So that's where my job comes in. You can't do everything in life. You have to make choices. And what I like to do is explore and get, get the IUCN the, the information they need. And then they can assess it and work with that. A person can't do everything. So I chose the part that is the exploration part. Which is definitely the fun part and definitely important. I, I also wanted to maybe uh, two seconds talk about you're doing a lot of educational content distribution to school kids in the U.S. Can you uh, briefly touch on that? Well, we were contacted by them. They wanted to do this, but we need the funding. So okay. we're in that process. We're in that process. Okay, great. Well, we're near the end of our time, and uh, you know, I'm looking forward to our part two, but maybe mention your book now and uh, let folks know what they will be seeing and what we'll talk a little bit more in our next interview. Okay, this is my first solo book, and it is 151 of the best pictures of 151 species of freshwater fish from the Orinoco River. So there's pictures of the fish taken in their natural habitat, underwater, just with a snorkel and a camera. And uh, the cool thing is that you're going to see the fish exactly what they look like, not hybrids that you probably find in the store. This is let's say, a historic record of how the fish looked like in the wild when they weren't mixed or, you know, interbred. So that's what you will see. You'll see all the habitats, the plants, and the fish exactly how they look in the wild. As I mentioned at the beginning of our interview, you, you did me the honor of sending me the first 50 pages, and yeah, they're beautiful, really spectacular, uh, you know, and I'm sure they were really difficult shots to get, you know, when you're snorkeling and doing all that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to our, our part two, where we'll talk more about that. So when will the book go on sale? We're hoping to have it on sale by the end of October and coming out by the holidays. They should be already being delivered by the holidays. Okay. As great. of now, we're just getting the people that wanted to leave their emails. So they're the first ones to get it, to sign up and get the book once it's out. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, it's definitely beautiful, a coffee table book and more. Well, we're near the end and, and I uh, really appreciate all your time, Ivan, and of course our, our producer, Mark Winter. But Ivan, did you have any final words of wisdom for our listeners? Oh, just the best thing you can do is go out and explore the nearest body of water that you have near your house. Whatever it is, just go and take a walk in it, look at it, get to know it, and make it yours. Because it's the only way to have feel empathy towards water is to be there and look at it and make it yours. Well, thanks again for that, and thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it, Ivan. Thank you. Please be sure to check out Ivan's many web links. We'll have all of those on our Aquarium Mania guest page for him. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for a show, email me at drroy at petliferadio.com. That's D-R-R-O-Y at petliferadio.com. Until next time, please be sure to check out Ivan's videos, photos, YouTube channel, and books. Visit your local aquarium stores, and be sure to keep your tanks clean and your fish and animals healthy. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.